So before we start, I'd like to announce that I've got a new EP out on my Bandcamp. It's kind of a mixture between some easy listening, jazz, vapor wavy, more softy type music. It's also out on cassette tape and I think there might be a couple left in stock. So I'd really appreciate it if you checked it out. And as always, thank you for checking it out and for your financial support. Right, without any further ado, let's get on to the video. It is the morning of the 30th of July 2016 and a hot air balloon is being prepared for a passenger sightseeing flight in Texas, USA. The morning hopes to yield stunning views aboard the check made envelope and basket. Little did the 15 passengers and pilot know that the morning would end in tragedy. Today we're looking at the heart of Texas hot air balloon disaster. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. I've always liked hot air balloons, but my fear of heights has precluded me from going aboard one, and that's probably a good thing. Many years ago, in my early 20s, I used to live in Guildford, and being not the most interesting place in the world to live, me and my uni housemates used to walk along the canal out to the countryside. One day we came across a balloon launching. It was really fascinating seeing it rise up into the sky, but I always wondered how they avoided telephone and power lines. Well, today's story shows the risk of flying near such hazards. Background Our story's background is rather small today, as the company behind the disaster, the heart of Texas, was a one-man operation, namely the pilot on the fateful flight. Not particularly bizarre, as many tour and experience companies work is sporadic and seasonal. However, although being run by one person and not a large corporation, corner cutting in our story will still rear its ugly head. The company was operated by Alfred Nichols, who began his hot air balloon pilot's career in 1992, with his issuance of his student pilot's license in the February. By October 1993, he had passed all the requirements to gain a commercial hot air balloon pilot's license. Interestingly, the FAA doesn't require commercial balloon pilots to have a medical certificate, at least in the 1990s, but they were expected to follow the rough rule of only be a pilot if you are fit enough to do so. Officially written, as I quote from the NTSB report, Title 14 CFR 61.53 states that for operations not requiring a medical certificate, a person shall not act as a pilot in command or in any other capacity as a pilot flight crew member. While that person knows or has reason to know of any medical condition, that would make the person unable to operate the aircraft in a safe manner. Additionally, no person may act or attempt to act as a crew member of a civil aircraft while using any drug that affects the person's faculties in any way contrary to safety. So remember this as it may explain the disaster later on. Throughout Nichols' adult life, he experienced a number of run-ins with law enforcement, and this was mainly for drink driving. In addition, he suffered from a number of medical conditions, which, if he was a commercial fixed wing or helicopter pilot, would have disallowed his holding of a commercial pilot's license. Over his time operating balloons, Nichols gained a reputation for, shall we say, less than optimal decisions, often flying above cloud level, descending through cloud cover and in weather which gave a below one mile of visibility. All of which basically means flying with nickels was a bit of a gamble. But this is because hot air balloons are usually flown using visual flight rules and don't generally have radar, essentially making you blind in the clouds, blind to potentially deadly ground mounted obstacles. Nichols hot air balloon envelope and basket was made in the Czech Republic in 2014. It had three burners connected to four propane fuel cylinders. The basket had a total capacity of 18 persons, including space for crew. It is meant to get a yearly checkup, having received its last certificate in May 2015, but by the time of our disaster, the balloon was two months overdue. Again, keep a mental note of this as the whole heart of Texas business operation was a little bit of a dumpster fire. Well, we will come back to the shortfalls of the company in a bit, but in the meantime, shall we get on to the disaster? And I should also say it's time for our bingo card. 
the disaster. It is the 30th of July 2016, and 15 passengers are meeting in a car park in San Marcos, Texas. They are greeted by the ground crew and pilot, and after signing the relevant releases, are transported to the launch site. It is just before 6 o'clock in the morning. The flight is set to depart from the Furnace Air Park. As the ground crew, pilot and passengers arrive, the air balloon is then inflated. The decision to launch is solely the responsibility of the pilot, and he thinks it's a good day today. You see, many of the passengers have had previous flights cancelled due to poor weather or visibility. It's not uncommon for multiple reschedulings, but not for today. The pilot had a method of telling if the visibility was good. This was by seeing if he could see some utility poles near the airfield. He could, so the launch was set to go. The passengers clambered aboard the basket and prepared for some stunning morning views. The time is 6.50. Eight minutes later, all 16 souls aboard begin their ascent. Due to it being 2016, many passengers had smartphones, so were able to take photographs and videos during the flight. Within minutes of launch, photos show that visibility was reduced. Clouds and fog could be seen rolling in towards the balloon. As the flight continued, the fog eased in. By around 7.05 in the morning, the ground was still visible, but only just. This became intermittent as the balloon continued its journey. At roughly just before 7.30 in the morning, the pilot sent his position to the ground crew. This was via a navigation application he had on his tablet computer. The ground crew chief tried to send messages back to the pilot, but for whatever reason they were unsuccessful. As the flight continued, the visibility continued to drop. Minutes ticked by as the pilot began to execute the balloon's descent. At about 7.42 in the morning, the balloon descended. It struck a power line, arcing ensued and the basket caught alight. The support cables that held the basket to the envelope received severe electrical damage and all but 14 of the 28 support cables failed. The envelope, now detached, travelled around a half a mile in the breeze. The basket plunged into the ground. All aboard would be killed during the fire, crash and eventual 100 foot fall to impact with the earth. The balloon had travelled in total from launch to crash about 8 miles. As emergency teams were called out to the crash site, the first responders were greeted to a burning basket, which ultimately ended with very little remaining. The crash cause was apparent, i.e. the power lines. But how did the balloon end up impacting them? Well, this is where a long-term friend of the channel, the NTSB, would come into play. The Aftermath The NTSB were informed of the accident on the same day, and an investigator was dispatched to the crash scene. The following investigation would look at the meteorological conditions on the day, the aircraft's condition, and the pilot's ability to fly. Pretty much all of these lines of investigation would bring blame to the feet of the pilot. Clearly the cloud cover and fog on a day were not safe to fly in, and although the balloon was overdue, its annual inspection was found to have no pre-crash defects. Weather reports for the day were showing a high likelihood of reduced visibility. These reports were not obtained by the pilot. If he had, as he should have, then flight for the day should have been cancelled. The disaster was looking like the pilot had very questionable decision-making abilities. The decision to fly and descent through clouds were not the actions of the most conscientious pilot. But why? Well, the NTSB looked into Nicole's medical history and it was discovered that he had in his bloodstream both prescription and over-the-counter medications. This is not always the end of the world, but some of those medications would be considered as impairing, such as bupropion, an antidepressant, cyclobenzaprine, a sedative, diazepam, also a sedative, methylphenidate, a stimulant used to help with those with ADHD, and oxycodone, a painkiller. This mixture, with addition of some cold and allergy medications, were determined by the NTSB to affect the pilot's decision-making skills. The pilot also missed multiple opportunities to land as the visibility reduced. Instead, he went above the clouds, making him essentially blind. The NTSB also criticised the FAA's exemption for balloon pilots' requirements to hold a medical certificate. The NTSB would give their probable cause in their report into the disaster. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's pattern of poor decision making that led to the initial launch, continued flight in fog and above clouds. 
and descent near or through clouds that decrease the pilot's ability to see and avoid obstacles. Contributing to the accident were the pilot's impairing medical conditions and medications, and the Federal Aviation Administration's policy to not require a medical certificate for commercial balloon pilots. Now, some rules would change. The FAA would update the exemption on pilots. In 2022, as noted in a news post on the FAA website, the Federal Aviation Administration adopted a final rule today requiring commercial hot air balloon pilots to hold a medical certificate when flying paying passengers. The rule mandates a second class medical certificate, the same required for other commercial pilots, which is good as it did seem like a bit of a silly exemption. So it's now scale time. It's going to be a free. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons attribution share like license. Plain Difficult videos produced by me, John, in a currently surprisingly sunny corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second YouTube channel, Instagram and a Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. So check out all the links in the pinned comment below. And I'd like to say a very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members whose financial support helps this channel tick along, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch and listen to me talk about disaster videos. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and Mr Music, play us out please. <laughs> <laughs>